Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. If you've ever had the opportunity to be taught by Russ Miller, you know why he's considered one of the top biblical apologists in the world. I believe Russ was created by God to teach believers why you can absolutely trust the Bible to be the ultimate science book, that God's Word is 100% accurate, word for word, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 that the earth was created in six literal days, that the flood of Noah was an actual event. None defends the Bible better than Russ Miller. Enjoy this presentation, Science and the Bible. Hey, how are y'all doing this morning? Awesome, wow. Well, you know, I want to open with a word of prayer, and then I want to get right into uh, what we're going to call Science in the Bible. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and for your soul that's here today. I thank you for Compass and the staff and just everyone that's helping this uh, conference go. I hope and I do pray that the information shared by the speakers today will be, uh, first of all, led by you and will strengthen faith and bring people that see this to saving faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his great name that I do pray. Amen. Hey, it's great to be here this morning. I actually uh, put together a new message for this morning, and I'm going to go ahead and get right into it because Bill's kind of mean. He only gives us 45 minutes. So I know at the time he's going to be getting the hook out and pulling me off the stage. So let's go ahead and get started. You know, the Bible tells us to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. You ever hear someone say, oh, you're not supposed to prove the Bible. You ever hear that? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible wants you to prove the Bible's true. God isn't afraid of science. Real science is a believer's best friend, as I'm about to show you. Uh, so let's look at science in the Bible. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The Bible is not a science book, but it's the true history book of the universe. Thusly, if the Bible's true, it will hold up perfectly to real science. And my friends, real science is a believer's best friend. There's a lot of neat little nuggets in the Bible that actually science proved were true two to 3,000 years after the Bible proclaimed them. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah, we're told that God sits upon the circle of the earth, and 2,000 years later, science caught up and proved that the earth was indeed spherical. In Jeremiah, we're told that the moon divides the seas, and well, 2,300 years later, science caught up with that and proved that the gravity of the moon causes the, the tides on our earth twice a day dividing the seas. In Job, we're told the light scatters the wind, and well, 2,800 years later, we finally figured out light is instrumental in causing the wind on our planet. Um, the Bible contains over 83 verses about the need for cleanliness to prevent spreading disease. And these verses are written over 3,000 years before we discovered germs. In fact, the verses that are in Leviticus are responsible for ending the plagues in Europe in the 13 and 1400s that killed millions of people. They finally started following the rules in Leviticus and ended the plagues. But I always hear, and you've probably heard also, that, that the sciences are at odds with Scripture. You guys heard something along those lines before? Well, first of all, real science, what I call real science, operational science, is a believer's true friend. Always has been, always will be. Operational science is knowledge derived from the study, testing, and operation uh, and observation of repeatable evidences. Things have to be testable, studyable, and repeatable for their findings to be knowledge known as operational science, a believer's true friend. Most folks don't realize it today, but over 82% of the branches of modern science were started by Christians. Did you know that? Over 80% of the branches of modern science. We thought, well, there's an intelligent creator. He probably put some laws and rules in place to govern his creation. And if we would set out and study the creation, they call that nature today, we could discover some of those things and put them in practice in our lives. That is, is what has led to modern science and all the great discoveries that we've made that improve our lifestyles today. Now, at the same time, over the last 150 plus years, secularists have taken over science and undermined operational science, but real science, based on the study of evidence, is still a believer's best friend. 
Uh, in Isaiah 45, we're told that God formed the earth to be inhabited. Well, the anthropic principle holds that the observable features, laws, and physical attributes of our solar system are ideal for allowing life to exist on earth, especially human life. Let me give you, and there's hundreds of these principles in the uh, anthropic principle. Let me just give you a couple. The uh, proton to neutron balance is perfect to allow life to exist on earth. If it were messed up, we wouldn't have life like we know it today. The speed of light traveling through our, our system at 186,282 miles per second is perfect to allow life to exist. If it was slower or faster, it would mess up the proton to neutron balance. I have scoffers tell me, well, God couldn't get light here. It would have killed everything on earth. Well, maybe that's the reason God got light here on the first day before he made any life forms. <laughs> God might just be a little smarter than some people give him credit, you know? You know, the distance to our sun is perfect to allow life to exist on earth. If we were 2% closer to the sun, all the water would evaporate. There'd be no life on earth. If we were 2% further from the sun, all the water would freeze. There wouldn't be life like we know it today. And over the, the expanse of the universe, the temperatures range by tens of millions of degrees. Water is only liquid in a little bitty 180 degree space. And God has the earth right in that little space to allow life to exist. If you put that tens of millions of degrees on a scale, you'd have to start in Paris, France, come across the Atlantic, cross the United States, across the Pacific, and in that scale in Tokyo, Japan. And water is only liquid in a one-foot range. And God has us right smack in the middle. The anthropic principle. There are hundreds of such um, observations. And just to get 10 of them in a row would be like quadrillion to the 10th power. And there are hundreds of them. In fact, this uh, scientist, Nobel Prize winning astrophysicist stated, the best data are exactly what I would predict. predicted. I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses. There is no scientific reason not to read God's word and believe God's word. In fact, the one of the great prophecies found in the New Testament in 2 Peter 3, where they'll come in the last days scoffers. You guys see any scoffers today? <laughs> wow. And they're going to be saying that all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. This is, a, this is known as uniformity. They believe in uniformity. They, they think the present is the key to the past. They think everything has been pretty much the same. So they can look at, let's say, the Colorado River and the amount of sediments it's taken out of the Grand Canyon today, and based on uniformity, it's always been the same. They can look at the size of the canyon. It's missing 908 cubic miles of sediments and say it took millions of years for that river to carve out the canyon. That's based on uniformity, just like the Bible said they would do in the last days. And that brings us to historical science. I speak on college campuses and the kids will go, oh, I've never heard of historical science. Well, of course not. They're not going to tell you this. They're lying to you. They're misleading you. Historical science is not knowledge derived from the study of evidence. It is assumptions derived from applying operational science to past events that you cannot test, study, and observe. So think about that. They have their bias and they make assumptions based on believing in uniformity that all things we see today have been pretty much the same and they apply that to past non-observable events. That's historical science, assumptions. But it's the bias of the individual researcher that undermines historical science. Their beliefs in uniformity, which leads to the denial of the global flood, which would mean things are not uniform, corrupt the non-observed assumptions of historical science. This is where controversy exists with Christianity and the Bible. The, the, um, the controversy is not about real science, operational science. It's about assumptions masquerading in the form of historical science. Unfortunately, quite a bit of biology and actually a lot of geology is actually historical science not operational science. 
No wonder in 1 Timothy we're warned to avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some believing, professing, have erred concerning the faith. Any of you guys think it was a local flood? That's called erring concerning the faith. I'm going to help you with that today. I've got a lot of information to help you. I'm not here to attack you, by the way, or anyone that believes those things. I'm here to help you. Just like someone helped me one time. I was a theistic evolutionist at one time. That's, that's a Christian who believes in a Jesus who used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly uh, evolve us. There's progressive creationists that think they believe in a Jesus who used millions of years of death and suffering to slowly create us. And, and on, the problem you have with those is you won't find any of those in the Bible. Don't be mad at me for saying that. If I just stepped on your toes, I hope right now you're thinking, praise God. Because I'm going to show you how you can believe in the, the only version of Jesus found in the Bible. Hey, how did the, uh, how did the universe begin? First five words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. We think there is an intelligent creator behind things that we see today. But let's go to New Scientist magazine. <laughs> think about what this says. In the beginning, and this is hard to grasp. In other words, <laughs> this... <laughs> Get ready for this one. This is, okay, this is hard to grasp, but the universe may have made itself. Well, Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity holds that the universe is a big result, and it had a beginning. It had a, had a starting point, and it's a big result of something. So it had to have a beginning cause. Well, logic holds that for any result that had a beginning... Okay, the cause of the result cannot be a part of the result. The cause had to be there before the result. It, had to, it has to exist outside of the result. In other words, the cause of the universe had to exist outside of and before the universe's space, matter, and time. That's just pure logic. Yet, secularists teach the universe made itself. That doesn't make any logical sense at all. Of all ancient texts, only the biblical God claimed to be eternal without a beginning and to exist before space, matter, and time, making the biblical God the only logical creator of the universe. Now, next question is always, well, who or what made God? Well, being eternal without a beginning cause puts only the biblical God outside of the laws of cause and effect making the biblical God the only viable creator of the universe. Did you catch that? The only viable creator. See, we don't have to say in the beginning God created, but this is going to be hard to grasp. No, it's not going to be hard to grasp at all. Just don't be fooled by secular atheists and their biased opinions and assumptions masquerading as if they were science. Speaking of real science, a believer's best friend, what do the laws of physics support? Well, God told us that at the end of the sixth day, he looked at his creation and said it was finished. He said it was very good, and he declared creation was done. The first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy. That matter and or energy cannot be created or destroyed. Matter can change to energy, energy can change to matter, but the total amount of matter and energy in the universe is constant. It's set. It's done. I think when God said creation was finished, I think what he meant was creation was finished. <laughs> well, let's go to Science Magazine and see what they say. They quote Stephen Hawking here saying that there was absolutely nothing before the Big Bang. Well, wait a minute. If matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed, if there was nothing in the past, there would be nothing in the present. Um, nothing cannot make anything. So that brings us to the Messiah of, Dar of the Big Bang Theory. So that, you know, we're on our fourth Big Bang Theory. Did you know that? Christians always come up to me, God could have used the Big Bang. The Big Bang are, is atheists' excuse to get God out of the picture. The Big Bang is so unscientific. We're on our fourth Big Bang Theory. Did you know that? There was the steady state Big Bang, the hesitation model, the oscillating model. Now we're on the inflation or expanding model, and it's been debunked for 10 years now, but they can't get rid of it because the only other 
observation they can make is in the beginning God created and they don't want to go there. Don't credit God with atheistic excuses trying to attack him. So they've come up with the singularity. The singularity is the Messiah, they think, for the Big Bang Theory. So what they're basically saying is, and this is hard to grasp, <laughs> but all the matter and energy in the entire universe was squished together into a little bitty tiny particle the size of a, of a period at the end of a sentence. Yeah, that, and it, they don't, if you say exploded, they get mad. It expanded quickly, which would sound like an explosion to me, but hey, <laughs> that's, that's just me. So back to science and Steve Hawking. They quote him as saying, the laws of physics, think about this, cease to function in that tiny particle. It goes against the laws of physics. So they say the laws of physics don't, don't apply to their beginning. Wouldn't that make that what they would call a supernatural miracle? Hmm, just saying, you know. This uh, letter signed by dozens of scientists appeared in New Scientist magazine titled Bucking the Big Bang. Some of the quotes included, the Big Bang Theory can boast no predictions that have been validated by observation. Nothing they predicted stands up to what they see. They went on to state the theory relies on a growing number of never observed entities. I would think we call that fairy tales, <laughs> such as the singularity, inflation, dark matter, dark energy, etc., and can't survive without these fudge factors. Don't go around telling people God used the big dud. It never happened. It's totally non-scientific, and there's no observations that support it. It's a fairy tale. And remember, we're on our fourth version. So Discover Magazine interviewed this cosmologist and reported, after 35 years, he found that before our universe, there was nothing. Nothing at all. Well, I actually agree with that. Before God spoke and made the universe, you know, universe, universe, one verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, one verse. Before, the, before that, there wasn't anything. I don't disagree with that. But these guys spend millions of dollars in grant money in their <clears throat> research or whatever it is they're doing for 35 years and find nothing. You can ask these guys. After decades of research, what did you discover? Nothing. <laughs> Well, well, what evidence did you find? Nothing. But you believe nothing made everything? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm just reporting it. I'm not saying anything. You, you guys are, you can see what the only conclusion is that once upon a time, because a fairy tale is about to follow. Well, that brings us to the second law of thermodynamics known as the law of entropy that holds that things tend toward disorder. They lose energy, they wear out, they get worse and worse. This is the most accepted law in every branch of science, except evolutionary biology, which says things are evolving bigger and better. Uh, we'll get rid of, we'll destroy that here in just a couple more minutes. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews uh, that the earth and the heavens will perish, they'll wax old, they'll wear out, they'll lose energy. And 1,700 years after the Bible said so, we came up with the law of entropy. We finally caught up with the Word of God. So when you look at the, the second law, that things get worse and worse, you compare it to the Big Bang, which claims nothing got better and better and produced everything, including all of us. Huh, Interesting. Eventually evolving into all life forms, genetic information, and even intelligence. Nothing <laughs> came about to all this. The fact is the Big Bang makes no logical or scientific sense. Don't, don't credit God with secular atheist philosophies. Read God's word. Put your trust in the word of God. And remember, it's historical science. This is historical science I'm talking about. The Big Bang. Okay, how did life begin? Well, again, we're told in the beginning there was an intelligent creator who created life. I spoke on one college campus so much they finally made an accredited class attacking me in biblical creation. For the final exam, they just made fun of me for two hours. It's like, you know, I always say 
the name calling is the last bastion for those that have no evidence to put forth. And um, I actually, when, once they start calling me names, I've got them right where I want them. Because I'll just say, hey, name calling is the last bastion for those with no evidence to put forth. Let's stick to the evidence. Well, they can only go about another minute and they're back to name calling and everybody sees it. Everybody there would see it. In the beginning, God created. But in this class, they uh, use this book written by the president of the National Center of Science Education, who is an outspoken atheist, so you know where she's coming from. And so I said, well, let's see how the president of the National Center of Science Education explains how life started without God. And on page 26, she explains the origin of life was a continuum of events with a lot of iffy stuff in the middle. <laughs> You know what's really nice is I don't even have to make any of this up. I mean, they put it right there. In the, and that's the, the modern college textbook explanation of how life started without God. You know, the Bible, the only book in the history of the world that lives on its ability to correctly predict the future, uh, given to the ancient Israelites in the book of Jeremiah, they're told people would turn their back on God, saying a stone has brought them forth. Oh, goodness, that was 3,000 years ago. Now in the 21st century, I mean, we would never let anyone tell us we came from a stone, right? I mean, we're far too advanced. We're too, too smart. We're too technologically advanced to believe we came from a stone, right? Well, let's go to the modern textbook. Kids, kids, earth is thought, believed, to have formed four and a half billion years ago. That's historical science. And scientists theorize, think, believe, that earth started out as a big ball of rock. And oceans formed as it rained on the stone for millions of years, and poof, here we are today. They are teaching we came from a stone. Yep. Now, <clears throat> I had a couple things I'll say, but <clears throat> since this has been recorded, I'll just move on. <laughs> real science, a believer's best friend. What about the law of biogenesis? A principle of real biology is that life only comes from life. Non-living matter cannot produce life. So you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock. Where do they think we came from? You know, I have Darwinists or, or atheists come up and get around my face all the time. Oh, you believe your invisible God created the world. I just look at them and say, you believe we came from a wet rock. <laughs> Try it. You will like it. <laughs> they will stutter backwards and regroup and then, and then we don't believe we came from a wet rock. You're making fun of our position. Hey, look, I don't want to make fun of your position. I just want to make sure you understand what you think your position is. I don't think you really understand. But you believe in the Big Bang, right? They'll say yes. Don't get into which one or the problems with it because it'll take you off in a different direction. So you believe in the Big Bang, right? Yeah. So you believe next to nothing blew up and after billions of years, a big rock formed, right? Yeah. And it rained on the rock for millions of years, correct? Yes. So you're sitting there with this wet, sterile rock with no life, no organic matter at all on it, where do you think we came from? And they'll go, wow, I do believe we came from a wet rock. <laughs> and they've just realized what a bogus fairy tale they've been led to believe was science. And you have just prepared the soil to plant the seed. Wow. The law of biology, real science, a believer's best friend. So they're forced to uh, go with the iffy stuff because they can't explain how life could have started on its own. Even in labs with billions of dollars of lab equipment, salaries built on the research of millions of other scientists over the last 200 years, we cannot get life to start from non-life. The law of biogenesis. In the beginning, God created. What about biology in the Bible, though? Uh, atheist, well-known atheist Richard Hawking stated, biology is the study of complex things that that appear to be designed for a purpose. <laughs> he doesn't believe they were, but they, I mean, they sure look like they were, but we don't believe that. So, you know, they can't get life to start on its own. So let's just try to, you know, they say if we had the raw material for life, life would start on its own. We can't get life to start even in labs, as I mentioned. So let's give them the raw material to, to build a brick building. They say, given enough time, the magic ingredient, and a source of energy that somehow great design forms on its own. Well, life is way too complex, but let's just go with the brick building. We give them some brick and mortar, and for time, we give them a billion years. And for energy, we haul the brick and mortar up to the top of a, of a five-story building. 
And once per second for a billion years, we push off piles of brick and mortar. How many beautiful brick structures do we get that look like they were designed for a purpose? <laughs> Nothing. You're going to get this every single time, right? But let's say you took that same brick and mortar and gave it some simple human intelligence. You get a beautiful structure every time. The difference between intelligent design and random chance is immense. There is no comparison. But they're going to say, well, wait, snowflakes, salt crystals, rock crystals, they exhibit order. Well, <clears throat> there's a vast difference between the order that we find in a rock or salt crystal or snowflake, an ice crystal, and the complexity found in a living cellular system. Vast difference. Crystals formed by the orderly arrangement of their physical properties. Snowflakes and such exhibit order, but no complexity. Living cells form to, to the uh, complex genetic information held in their cells, DNA. Uh, snowflakes cannot ingest nutrients to convert into energy. They can't communicate. They can't reproduce young. They, they exhibit order, but no complexity. Well, the Bible says that he created, that God created every living creature. Bees are needed to pollinate flowers. We know that. The surface of the bucket orchid is very slippery. It's very slimy. So when a bee comes and lands on the petal, he slips and falls into that bucket below. Well, the bucket's filled with a little pool of slimy liquid. So he lands, splash, into the pool, and he's swimming around to get out. Well, the only way out is on the side of the tunnel, on the side of the bucket, there's a tunnel that goes to the outside. And there's a step at the edge of the liquid so he can climb up and get into the tunnel. So he swims over, gets up on the step, goes through the tunnel. But as he's going through the tunnel, the walls of the flower contract and capture the bee. And the flower glues two pollen sacks to his back and then holds it there until the glue dries. And then he lets it go. Now, when the bee flies to another bucket orchid, he lands and goes through the whole process again. He slips, falls in the bucket below, swims over to the edge, gets up on the steps, starts going through the tunnel, and again, the walls of the flower capture the bee. He's probably sitting there going, deja vu. I, wasn't I just, <laughs> didn't I just do this a minute ago? But this time, two hooks come out and remove the pollen sacks, completing the pollination process Talk about supporting evidence of our intelligent biblical designer. How could that have evolved over millions of years of time? How would the flower know to do any of that? Mind-boggling. We're told God created every winged fowl after his kind. Woodpeckers can peck as fast as a machine gun can shoot. But the sudden stop when they impact a hard object, like the side of my log cabin, which I like to peck holes in, creates hundreds of times the force of gravity. Well, the first time a woodpecker pecked something hard, what kept his head from exploding? Well, he was designed with muscles that pull his little bird brain away from his beak just prior to each impact. And he was designed with a spongy bone in his head that absorbs shock. This had to be there from the very start, or the first peck would have been the end of the woodpecker. Proof of our intelligent biblical designer. The Bible says, I'll praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The human brain computes and sends millions of electronic signals to billions of nerves throughout your body via your, your central nervous system. If you really think about this, being able to just to do this is a complete miracle. Wow. The human eye has over one and a quarter million nerve connections in a one square inch area. Awesome design. In Leviticus, we're told the life of the flesh is in the blood. And well, 3,000 years later, the science caught up with that and proved that the blood transports oxygen and nutrients, providing life for the flesh through your vascular system. Now think about it. What keeps us from bleeding to death all the time? Well, you were designed with a protein called fibrogen, that forms a fishnet across, across a, a cut or a scratch and, and catches blood cells forming a blood clot, keeping you from bleeding to death. Well, what keeps that fibrogen from forming a net right now and killing us all instantly? 
Well, it takes another protein to trigger the fibrogen. And it takes, well, what keeps that from triggering the fibrogen all the time? It takes another protein, it takes another protein. All in all, there are at least 25 very specific proteins in this cascade that have to be there at the exact point of a scratch at the, before the first scratch ever took place, or the first scratch would have been the end of mankind. Proof of our intelligent biblical designer. No wonder in Romans 1, we're told the invisible things from him and the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, so that those who do not believe in our biblical creator and judge and savior, Lord Jesus the Christ, will be without excuse when they stand before him. Well, what about evolutionary biology in the Bible? Well, the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools it doesn't mean someone's stupid. It just means they've been fooled. I know brilliant people that believe in Darwinian evolution. They have been fooled. And they changed the glory of their incorruptible God, which I think today is his creation, into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I think they're going to change creation into the fairy tale of Darwinian evolution. These verses are talking about idolatry. The highest form of idolatry is to think you're the most evolved. You're your own God. We call that humanism today. If you understand the difference between micro and macro evolution, you'd win a debate with any Darwinist anywhere in the world, from Stanford to Oxford to the local high school. This is why they don't debate anymore, by the way. Macro evolution is Darwinian type change, like a dog eventually turning into a non-dog. They basically teach a canine evolved into a whale. That would be Darwinian macro evolution. There's no evidence that it has ever taken place. Microevolution can be called microadaptations or microvariations. Uh, they're just simply kinds bringing forth after their kind. Dogs bringing forth dogs with changes within the kind or micro changes, and those are caused by the loss of information. I'll talk about that here in a, in a moment. But it's vital that Christians understand, you know, we're losing 90% of our kids today, have been for 30 years now, because they think Darwinian evolution is true. That's the number one reason they leave the church. And we can destroy Darwinism. I'm going to show you how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. So why are we losing 90% of our kids? 98% of churches block this information. Why we lose 90% of our kids? Why is it vital, though, that kids get the information that kinds only bring forth after their kind? And after millions of scientific experiments, every single one says kinds only bring forth after their kind. Why is that vital to know? Because 10 times in the book of Genesis, we're told plants or animals will bring forth after their kind. And it's the only thing real science, a believer's best friend, ever sees. But we can't get this information to our kids. Mind-boggling. So kids are given lots of examples of biblically correct micro-change. Brown butterflies producing yellow butterflies, red roses producing pink roses, etc. But then they switch the discussion to Darwinian macroevolution, and the kids think this is proof of Darwinian change when it's really proof the Bible's true. Churches block it because their pastors have been fooled by this, and they think people like me are crazy. We're anti-science. No, we're, we're real science. Real science is our best friend. Been doing this 20 years. It makes me sick. I finally accept there's not much I can do about it except get people like you to share it. But here's the thing about these micro and biblically correct variations, adaptations, microevolution. They're caused by the sorting or loss of the parent's gene pool. So gene pools get weaker and weaker. They're losing information. Entropy makes sense. And here's how I show people how to destroy Darwinism in four seconds flat. Gene depletion plus natural selection makes Darwinism impossible. You see, things are losing information. If they went unchecked, everything would go extinct in about 1,500 years because the gene pools would be corrupted. But they lose too much information. They die off. We call that natural selection. There's no selector there. I call it God's quality assurance program. <laughs> keeps his originally created beings genetically strong and keeps kinds bringing forth only after their own kind. But if you look at operational science, a believer's best friend, versus uh, Darwinism, you'll see the law of biogenesis holds Darwinism never could have started. The law of entropy holds things get worse and worse, not better and better. No one has seen, ever seen anything Darwinian macro evolve, which is why they, go, they show kids examples of biblically correct microevolution, micro change. Because, and the reason for the, the lack of macro evolution is that gene depletion plus selection makes it a scientific 
impossibility. This philosopher stated, posterity will marvel that so flimsy and dubious an hypothesis could have been accepted. He's saying people in the future are going to look back and laugh at us. How could you have believed such a ridiculous fairy tale? I don't know that people in the future are going to be able to see that. Because the God of this world is also the father of lies. And he's got control until Jesus comes and saves this fallen creation. What about geology in the Bible? Is the earth billions of years old? You know, people, if you don't understand why the age of the earth matters, if you're sitting there thinking, well, who cares if God created in six days or six billion years or whatever, you're missing the point. The numbers of years is not the main thing. That's a diversion tactic. You know, squirrel, squirrel, millions of years over here. No, no, the issue is when did death enter the creation? The Bible says man's sin brought in death, separating us from God, recurring our redemption through Jesus. Every old earth belief says, oh, no, no, God got that all wrong. It was billions of years of death that brought you along. It's the death issue that, that matters. It has little to do with the actual numbers of years. That's a diversion tactic. Back to 2 Peter and one of the great prophecies. This is a spectacular prophecy, 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. But they're going to come in days, last days scoffers. This is the last days prophecy. They're going to be willingly ignorant. They're going to claim uniform processes, okay? And they're going to be willingly ignorant that by the word of God, the world that was being overflowed with water perished. The Bible foretold 2,000 years ago that in the last days, scoffers would claim uniform processes and deny the global flood. Any of you still want to claim it was a local flood? Because you're with them, okay? And I'm not saying you're a scoffer, but you're agreeing with the scoffers. So let me help you here. Let me help you. Follow this. I'm not going into great detail here just because of time, but secular geology for the last 150 years has been based on the belief in uniform processes with no global flood. Every old earth belief is based on the belief the earth's crust that we live our entire lives on, those sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density by moving water did not form in a flood. No, they form slowly and uniformly at rates we see today. One inch per thousand years or this many miles deep took hundreds of millions of years to form. Historical science. That's not real science. That's historical biased assumptions masquerading as science. But the Bible says that God judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. Well, is there any evidence to support a global flood? Well, first of all, those sedimentary layers stratified out by grain size, weight, and density. You ever seen a miner with a pan? He scoops up sediments and some water, sloshes it back and forth. The moving water stratifies out the, the sediments, separating them by grain size, weight, and density. Gold being the heaviest falls to the bottom. On a global scale, the fountains of the deep erupted, eroded about the top two miles of the Earth's crust in the pre-flood crust, and over the course of that year-long flood, separated the grain sizes by weight and density, and then redeposited them in the sedimentary layers laid down by water that we see today. That's the reason you have all shale together, all mudstone together, all sandstone together. They were separated by the moving waters, and they're full of billions of things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or be eaten by scavengers. We call those uh, fossils today. Trilobite fossils are found in the lowest layers. So we're told they were one of the first things to have evolved. Didn't they live at the bottom of the ocean? Wouldn't they be one of the first things buried? You know, the trilobite eye has, over, has a double lens design with up to 15,000 lens surfaces. Science News reported it's the most sophisticated eye lens ever produced. They say by nature. It was by God. It didn't come out by accident. They're saying that's the first thing to have evolved? <laughs> I think God's leaving them in derision. He's, he's laughing at them. They're going to be without excuse when they stand before their creator. That's proof for an intelligent designer. And this is a little bit technical. I'm going to try to explain this as, as, as simply as I can. Radio halos, when polonium forms, it gives off a burst of energy. Now, depending on the type of polonium, that burst of energy will last for different periods of time. Uh, polonium-210 will give off that energy for up to two years. Now, if it's in a rock or a log that petrifies or a rock that hardens, 
within that two-year period, you'll catch this ball of energy. It, now it's, it's petrified now. You ever see a big uh, firework go off of the sky? It gives that big burst of energy, and then it dissipates and disappears. Now, this is on a microscopic level, but it, it basically gives off that energy and then dissipates, unless it's caught up in less than a two-year period of time. Well, on the Colorado Plateau near Grand Canyon, they find these elliptical halos, elongated halos right there. See, it looks like a football, that dark halo, but it's been squished. It made the round energy, and then it got squished when the layer above was laid down. Well, these are found in the uh, Jurassic, Eocene, and Triassic layers, which we're told formed over 250 million years of time. But not only do you have the elliptical that the layer above was laid down and squished it, then it started forming the round circle again, which means they were still forming when the layer above was laid down, which proves all three layers formed in less than two years. And only the year-long global flood can explain that. And a global flood explains how all those sedimentary layers laid down by water form quickly, destroying every old earth belief that puts death before Adam. So if you came here this morning playing around with old earth beliefs, now you know you can drop them and believe in the Jesus Christ found in the Bible. Well, praise God. So we find geologic compression events. Entire mountain ranges, 100 feet thick of finely stratified layers got squished together like an accordion with up to 160 degree bends in the rock. But the rock's not broken. How do you bend rock like this without breaking it? Now, secularists are going to say, well, the whole... The whole mountain range was subducted 10 miles below the surface, superheated and melted. And when it got pushed back up to the surface, that's when the folding took place. Yeah, there, there's a problem with that, though. You see, if you superheated sedimentary rock, it would turn into metamorphic rock. But this is not metamorphic rock, it's sedimentary layers. Toward the end of the flood, when the, when the mountains arose and the valley sank down and continental drift took place quickly, when they stopped, you had mountain ranges that were still... Mud, squished together, and then they hardened into rock, folded, yet not broken. We find polystrata fossils, trees, even fish fossils, that go through multiple strata. They, they had to form quickly, not slowly. Remains of fossils uh, in the, in the fossil-bearing layers have been found with blood cells, proteins, amino acids, even soft, flexible tissues. So they found some salt crystals. We're told that they're 250 million years old, but they had bacteria trapped in them, and the bacteria are still alive. Maybe they're only a few thousand years old. Eh? Hmm. So a friend sent me this package of rock salt. On the label, it says it's 250 million years old. And at the bottom, it says it expires in June of next year. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell you, I saw that and my first thought was we got her just in time. <laughs> so, why does the global flood matter? Well, in Genesis 1 and 3, we we're told that God gave us a perfect creation. No death, no suffering in it. Well, what happened to it? Adam's original sin. Adam's original sin corrupted that perfect creation, allowing death to enter. But more importantly, that, that, se that separated us from God, requiring our redemption through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when you put death before Adam, as all old earth beliefs do, you can't explain that foundational uh, issue. Once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam sin brought in death. Do you see that? Satan is an expert at what he does. He's subtle and he's devastating. Old earth beliefs undermine the gospel message. Jesus said you tell good from bad by the fruit. Billions have rejected Jesus because of being convinced of old earth beliefs. Just like don't try to mix the big bang into the word of God. Don't mix death before Adam beliefs into the word of God. The global flood wipes them all out. Because if you believe in an old earth belief, even one of the supposed Christian ones, You've been taught it was a local flood, haven't you? You're denying the global flood, just like the Bible said would happen. But now you know better. 
And you can drop it, and your faith should skyrocket. No wonder Jesus said, if I have told you of earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? How indeed. The calling of our ministry is to teach about the creation, evolution, and age of the earth issues, and to provide a reason for the hope that's in the heart of all true believers and all true seekers. But when we look at science in the Bible, we see that operational science, knowledge derived from the study of the evidence, is a believer's best friend. And I think we should define it as knowledge derived from the study of God's creation. That is real science. This is Christian and, and uh, biblical creationist Sir Francis Bacon, who's known as the father of the scientific method. He stated, a little science as strange as a man from God, a little more brings him back. <laughs> Put your trust in the word of God, word for word, and cover to cover. Let me end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning and for every dear soul that's here today. I hope and I pray the information we shared will be a blessing. Uh, strengthen faith and bring people to saving faith in our creator, judge, and redeeming savior, Lord Jesus the Christ. Thank you guys. God bless you. Amen. You've been watching Science and the Bible, presented by Russ Miller. To view more stealing titles, get information on our Holy Land trips and future Bible conferences, go to compass.org.